Okay. This is the Colonel Dev Room. Uh, in case you wandered into the wrong uh, room, uh, the next talk is by uh, Stefan Graber uh, about isolated username spaces. All right. Hello, everyone. So, uh, as Christian mentioned, I'm Stefan Graber. I work for myself and I've been doing container stuff for the past 15 years or so at this point. I'm also the project leader for Linux containers. And with me, I've got Alex, who is a kernel engineer on the LexD team at Canonical. Um, and basically, this topic is something I've been, I've been thinking about and talking to a whole bunch of people, Christian, and whoever else was at Plumbers for the past I don't know, three, four years at this point. Um, so since about 2018, and uh, I got lucky enough to have uh, Alex at Canonical, who's then been able to actually get this thing working. So. Um, Bit of an intro, what, uh, what our user namespace is, to just kind of give an update on the current state of things before we try and replace it all. So, um, user namespaces were introduced back in this, well, fully introduced back in 3.12, 3.13-ish, so that's back in, that's back in 2013, 2014 timeline. Um, they allow for the, so that allows for the creation of uh, a namespace, obviously, uh, in which uh, one can map a like one or multiple ranges of UIDs and GIDs. Um, so you you effectively decide that like oh in this namespace my UID 1000 is equal to UID 100,000 on the host or something like that. Um, this allows for much safer containers because you can now map root in the container to be something other than root on the host. So even if something bad was to happen and you could escape the container for some reason then you would end up being a nobody user on the system instead of being real root. Um, that's kind of the idea. It's been used uh, a fair bit um, in some container managers, especially the ones that uh, we developed. Uh, so LXC, LXD, in case all of those use user namespaces quite extensively. Uh, it is also possible to use in Docker, Podman, all of the others now, uh, but doesn't tend to be the default. So uh, just to kind of show the current state of things again, uh, so if I on that one on, there we go. Um, let's just take a quick look at how that stuff works. So as a completely normal random user on my system, I can just do user namespace, remap, and now I'm root. Um, except I'm not, but you know, I'm root in that namespace anyways. So when you do that, it just maps the root user to your own user. So my own user on my laptop is UID 21105, uh, and that's what root is in there. That works. But nothing else is mapped. So if I try to actually switch to any other user, things are just going to blow up. Uh, well, actually, that user doesn't even exist, but um, which would exist. I guess nobody would. And yeah, that, it's just not going to work. Those users just don't, plain don't exist, uh, which is going to cause a bunch of interesting side effects, like everything belonging to nobody, no group, all that kind of stuff. But that's for an individual user just creating a community and privileged namespace, and that works. Now, if you look at a um, at doing the container instead, so if we just create, as well as using incurs in this case, uh, just creating an Ubuntu container. There we go. And if we go in there, then that container is going to have an UID map and a GID map. So in this case, it means UID zero in the container is mapped to UID one million on the host, and the following one billion UIDs and GIDs are mapped the same the same way. So um, UID 1000 would be UID 1 million, 1, 000, 1 000, whatever on the host. Um, we can also do as a, like multiple maps, so you can start doing kind of punching type stuff. So if you go and modify and you say, hey, actually I would like uh, UID 1000 on the host to be UID 1, uh, 5000 in the container. I think that's in that order that it works. Then you start the container back, and if you look at the map, uh, did I forget to do something? <laughs> So that you want hmm? Oh, I looked at G. Oh, that's why. Hey, look at that. It's actually, it shows you can actually do maps differently for UIDs and GIDs. So yeah, UID does have that punch in the middle, which effectively causes three maps. That works. Uh, that's been around. It's fine. Um, that's the status quo, effectively. Now, what's wrong with this stuff? Well. So the current implementation, uh, it relies on still a single global UID and GID space. Uh, and you get to then map, like create namespaces and map their UID and GID back to 
some chunk of that global UID space, a uh, global UID GID space. That works. Um, but you can create overlaps, so you could have multiple containers that actually map to the same thing. Uh, you can have some random processes on the host that actually use the same UIDs and GIDs as you're trying to use in some containers. And that can cause some issues. That can cause the occasional, uh, oops, I've got way more privilege than I intended to have. Um, and also, it can cause some issues with like potential denial of service attacks if you're starting to like use user-specific limits or that kind of stuff. Um, there is a way to try and avoid that, which is using uh, Shadow's sub-UID and sub-GID files, along with uh, some helpers called new UID map and new GID map. And the idea with those tools is you get to actually assign for each user what maps they're allowed to use on the system. Uh, and so long as everyone uses those helpers and everyone looks at the file, there shouldn't be any conflicts. The problem is that not everyone uses the helpers and not everyone looks at the file. Um, and even when they do look at the file, but the tools that write the file get really confused sometimes. This is an example of what happens when it gets really confused. Um, I mean, nobody in this room, hopefully, can figure out what the root user actually gets as far as allocation, because even if you could, it's just broken. There's like, they actually overlap each other and conflict to the point where if you actually try to figure it out, it just ends up with something that's invalid. Um, that's a bit of a problem. And just the general concept hasn't really worked out. So in practice, most tools at this point just ignore those files entirely and just do whatever they want. Um, but that can have security implications, which is not ideal. So um, what can we do about this issue, right? Um, well, what if we had a lot more UIDs and GIDs? I mean, that would fix everyone's problems, right? Um, like, what about a lot more of them, you know? Like about, say, 4.2 billion times as many. Uh, well, yeah, that's effectively what we've, what we've been doing. So in the Linux kernel, a UID or a GID that's represented as a UN32. We've changed that to a UN64. Um, that obviously comes with some interesting side effects, which we'll get through. Um, but that's the general idea, and that's the kind of concept we came back uh, with uh, at Linux Plumber's kernel summit back in 2019. Now, yeah, but that's going to break everything, right? Well, it doesn't have to. So we obviously can't change user space to use 64-bit UIDs and GIDs. We're not going to even try to do that. That would be a very bad idea. Uh, and we would actually just move the problem, not fix it. No, what we want to do instead uh, is keep that only in kernel and have, of that 64-bit, 32-bit is your normal user-visible UID and GID. 32-bit is effectively an ID, like a, a namespace ID, if you wish. Um, and well, the obvious issue with that now is, okay, what happens with you know, persistence? What happens with anything that is not in that namespace looking at those kind of IDs? You're going to have issues there. Well, if it's a process outside of the namespace looking at a process running in, in such a namespace, uh, we can use the, uh, the, U cr the credential attached to the user namespace to figure out who created the user namespace and use that as kind of the proxy ID we show. So that's one thing we can do. On the file system side, uh, we're going to go into more details in a tiny bit, uh, but effectively we absolutely don't want the file systems to, be aware, to have to be aware of any of that, like file systems, still 32 bits, still normal. Um, that means that out of the box, you won't be able to write or even really read anything. Um, but thankfully, there are mechanisms in the Linux kernel now that makes it possible to actually handle those kind of translations and mappings, which then fixes that. So um, how does that stuff work? So here you've got a tiny bit of code that actually creates one of those namespaces. So you do unshared user namespace, as usual. And then normally, you would go ahead and at that point write your map. So you would normally write your UID map and your GID map. Instead, we just write to that magic file and say, hey, we want an isolated user namespace. And then we switch to the root user, and we're done. Uh, at that point, you are running as root inside of that isolated user namespace, and you get to use every single UID and GID that you want. Um, as mentioned, don't try to access the file system. That is not going to work well. But as far as you being able to like, spawn process, like actually switching user and messing with those users, that's going to work. Um, and there's quite a few more things you can actually do in that stage, even before you look at any kind of data uh, persistency or any of that kind of stuff. So, okay, fine, file system, what happens there? All right, so on the file system front, um, there are kind of two different things you can do. 
The first one is, hey, you're in a user namespace, you can unshare also a mount namespace. Now in that mount namespace that you own, anything you can mount is owned by your namespace and you can write to that. Um, obviously, we don't allow mounting most stuff inside of a user namespace because that would be a terrible security risk. So your options are mostly TempFS, um, you can also mount Fuse, and you can mount a few other, uh, other select file systems in there. And if you do, on those you can, because they are effectively virtual, were created from within the namespace, you can persist, like whatever UIDs you see inside of that namespace will be written as such on that file system. That works perfectly fine. Now, if you care about, you know, normal file systems and persistency and all that kind of boring stuff, uh, well, then that's when you need to, to actually use a new feature, uh, which uh, was introduced by Christian over there. Uh, a while back called uh, VFS ID map. And with that, it lets you, um, so that is, that does need a privileged uh, operation, obviously. Um, but as a privileged user, you can now say, this mount on the host needs to be, like on outside of the namespace, needs to be exposed inside the namespace at this path. And um, this map is applied for the transition between the two, which most often for us means we just want to map one-to-one -one from inside of the associated namespace to the host. So if you write as UID 1000 in that isolated thing, it shows up as 1000 on the file system. So that's, that's effectively how you handle the persistent thing. You need to pick specifically what file system you want. You need to go through a privileged helper type tool to pass those through as a VFS ID mapped mount and then you get to actually, to actually use this thing. So, let's take a look. Uh, I'm gonna go into, uh, what's the, I actually have that in my notes, hold on. Just trying to figure out what the name of the VM is now. Uh, user NS, this guy. Pretty sure, yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is a virtual machine which is running, um, Alex's patch sets on top of uh, the current 6.8 RC1 kernel. And right now, I'm, right now I'm root, so let's not do that. So I'm gonna switch to the Ubuntu user and I'm gonna go into a folder where we've got um, some tooling uh, that we've used to, to set that stuff up. So if we look in here, uh, we've got a tool called goisolated.c. Uh, if we go look at the code for that, it's pretty much a slightly longer version of what I showed on this on the screen earlier. So it does an unshare, it sets the isolated UNS um, bit, and after that it switches to uh, both uh, UID and GID to root in there, and then it execs whatever command I'm passing it. Okay. So the way we're gonna call that is we're gonna call it as, well, call that wrapper, and then have it call unshare and we're asking unshare to also unshare effectively the mount namespace, the PID namespace, and to fork. So that gives us mostly a mostly functional container. Okay, so we do that, and now we're root again. Uh, but this time, if we go look at the maps, so UID map is empty, GID map is empty. So there's no maps there, because we didn't ask to actually map anything to the host, we just have that isolated user namespace. Okay, so we've got Fine, like we're root, we could do that before, it's okay. Uh, we've got another helper here called setuid.c, uh, which is also extremely simple. Uh, all it does is it changes your UID and it executes the command. So, okay, fine. Um, so let's do setuid1000 bash. So that worked. That's something that would not normally work. Normally a normal unprivileged user cannot create a user namespace and gets more than just their own ID. So you can make root work, but you can't make an arbitrary number of users work. Like I can do, you know, I don't know, just mash the keyboard for whatever number and that works. Um, so you get to do that. And now, um, oopsie, uh, what does it want? Okay, fine. I just need to get a second shell um, and we're gonna go back inside of that VM. So isolated, it's a NAS bash in the default project. So now if we look uh, at the tree from outside of that namespace, what we see is, uh, and you see it, I, I can't actually highlight, so you see it kind of towards the middle of the screen, you see uh, switching to Ubuntu user, there's a share, then there's the unshare, then there's another share. And we see that the old tree looks like it belongs to the Ubuntu user. That's not true, we know it's not true because that last bash is actually under that uh, whatever user I ended up typing on my keyboard. Um, 
but because that can't be represented to the host system in, uh, as a real UID, it shows, as I said, the, whoever created the user namespace, which in this case is the Ubuntu user, so it shows the tree as belonging to the Ubuntu user. Um, if we go back here and we look at the process tree, we're going to see something quite different. In this case, the host IDs can't be represented, so they all show up as the uh, kernel overflow, so nobody no group. But then our own processes do show correctly, so we see root root for the first two, and then we see, uh, what is it, like 4788, um, which is what, um, what I just matched on my keyboard earlier. So that works, okay, fine. Um, with that, if I try, like even as that root user, if I try to touch anything, I'm going to have a bad day, as I said. Five systems don't like this. Um, so they just tell you no. Okay, that's fine. But now if I go ahead and I mount a tempfs, so mount a tempfs on slash temp, hey, now, yeah, this works. You know, I can do that. It's fine. Um, if I switch to random, I, random user and I go here and foo, okay, that works. And if I look from this level still, um, Oops, we've got foo, did I create foo twice? Yeah, I did, okay. I should have actually created bar, it would have been nicer, so let me do that. Okay, so now we've got two files, one created by root, one created by 4788. Uh, you might notice that my setUID wrapper thing doesn't bother with groups, so it only changed the user, not the group, it's fine. Um, and we see those two files, but now what happens if we try to look at the same two files from, again, from outside of the namespace completely? Stefan? Yep. Do you want to take questions during the talk? Uh, we'll, I can probably do in like a minute for okay. doing the demo, yeah. That might be easier than going back to the demo at the end. Um, so just here, if we go look at one of those processes of 556, and we ask for the root file system, we look at the mount. Again, I'm outside of the isolated user namespace, so everything shows up as we ever created the user namespace. So we see Ubuntu, Ubuntu, in this case, as the owner for, for those files. Even though it's not quite it's not actually the real thing, but that's what's going to be shown in this case. Um, I'm just going to show uh, the last piece and then we can take a, a question for the demo, uh, which is the persistence piece. Uh, so in this case, again, my username, I said username space works. I've got multiple users in there. That's fine. I can write data so long as I write it on a tempfs, but that, none of that is obviously persisted in a meaningful way, and there's no way for you to do that. Um, you can access some files, as you've seen, like I've been using commands and stuff, that works. But it only works if the, like, if any random user, as in if the other permission would allow it. Um, because no other permission checks can actually work. Um, now, if we go back here, we've got another tool. Um, I just need to find the, us the usage for that one again. Uh, in my notes, there we go. Um, so, ns enter, yeah. Okay, so I need the process ID, so it's 556 we're using, and 556. So what that command does is it enters the mount namespace, but not the user namespace of the target process. It runs a command from the host, which uses a VFS ID map, to then map uh, from the host my home directory um, to a shared folder inside of that namespace. So we do that. And now here, if we go look at that uh, share folder, hey, the UIDs and stuff actually do resolve. Okay, that's cool. Was if we were to go look at the non-mapped version of it, which is this, they don't. Um, so now as root, I could go in uh, that share Ubuntu uh, and touch foo, and then as a, so if I do my set UID thing, and I switch to 1000 inside of there, and I touch um, again in the share, and we'll do bar. Uh, oops, sorry, Ubuntu bar there. And actually, this one should have been also share Ubuntu for now. Okay, so that worked perfectly fine. If inside of the namespace we go look at those two files, we see the ownership kind of behaving the way we expect it. And remember, like when I did that earlier, looking from the outside, it was all belonging to that fake Ubuntu user because that was the owner of the namespace. But this time we're doing it through a map. So if I go look at the file system tree here, we see that it just went through the map and actually persisted the data uh, going through that map as, as expected. 
Uh, there was a question? Yes. Yeah, hey, uh, you, you showed uh, how you touched a file as a root user, and yep. then you changed to the unprivileged user inside this isolated user namespace. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how is it possible that this unprivileged user is able to touch a, like a file owned by a different user? Is that like how it's supposed to work? Um, that's a good point. Well, yeah, so it was the same group, that's true. <laughs> uh, because, of, because my set UID binary is kind of messed up, and it only changes the UID and not the GID. <laughs> Combined with the default U mask, it was allowed to do it. Um, if my set UID binary had done the right thing, which is change both the UID and the GID, that, that would have failed. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's effectively how that um, how that stuff works. It's it's got like there are a bunch of other places where um, where you will see uh, resources owned. Um, by the, an isolated user namespace from the outside in, in one way or another. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have to, like those are going to be showing, in this case, as the owner of the namespace. We're doing the owner of the namespace instead of going with the overflow UID, um, because the overflow UID has been, I think, one of the biggest confusion caused by the user namespace. So, in the user, with the user, normal user namespace, anything that cannot be represented is going to show up as that overflow UID. The problem is that the overflow UID is um, effectively the nobody know group uh, under POSIX, which is 65.534. The issue with that is that this is also an actual user. Um, so you end up with that really weird thing where you can have some stuff that runs, that shows up as the overflow UID. So I, I guess one example you could do is, so you've got a process tree, you've got a, you've got a user namespace in there. You've got some processes running in there. They show up as the overflow UID if you look at those from a, another user namespace. And then if, uh, if in that other user namespace you actually switch to the nobody user, you will think that like, well, I am UID 65.544. Those processes run according to everything as 65.544. I should be able to like, kill them. And no, you can't because they're not actually running as that UID. And that's, that's been causing a ton of confusion. So we're trying to do things a bit differently here and hopefully make things slightly less confusing. Um, remains to be seen, but hopefully. Uh, there was something else, question? Yeah. Yeah, the question, uh, so maybe I misunderstand a part of this, uh, this part of the demo. So is it, uh, is this uh, four and bar uh, files, or they have the owner and the group of user, is that uh, still inside the container or is it uh, visible outside of the container as root? So is it like uh, an escape from this uh, namespace or not? Or is uh, it because it is inside in a center? Uh, which one? The one I'm looking at right now? Yes. Okay, this is completely outside. So from inside the container, we were able to escape as root. Yeah, that's, that's yes, th that, that is, yes. The idea of ID mapped mounts. So right? with, a, with an ID mapped mount, that's effectively what you allow, yes. If you, if you, use, if you provide a, an ID mapped mount with the full map, then yes, the user is totally allowed to create a file that's owned by root and even make it set your ID if they want to. That is possible. That is why you need. You, that is why you need a privileged helper to be able to set that up. Well, no. In most cases, what we do is the path you actually share comes from a non-traversable path on the host, so that no user on the host can access any security binary you might be able to create in there. That's a specific uh, use case, for example. That yeah. or, you could use, or you could that use a map and map to and don't map wait, the UID wait zero. Wait a second, please. So, uh, when, for example, what uh, other users like Portman uh, and so on do. They use this uh, with OverlayFS or together with OverlayFS, and they, for example, ID map the underlying mounts that are used for uh, OverlayFS, but they leave the upper mount where the actual writes occur unmapped, which means that the writes that actually then go to disk uh, still occur as the container user ID and GID. So there are different ways to actually use this. This is just specific to yeah. LexD, for example. Yeah. So Not yeah, you need to be very or Incus, but specific. Yeah. You need to be very careful when you use that because indeed there is that pretty serious risk. Like if you do allow writing as UID zero on the host, then yes, you can start doing set UID stuff if you're not careful, for sure. And one thing, for example, you can do, uh, even if you do that, you can, like the, the ID mappings attached to a mount are completely independent of the user namespace. So for example, you could say, I want to ID map this mount, but uh, in this mount you can't write as root, so the UID zero isn't mapped, so you can't even create any yes. uh, files as UID zero or GID zero. So you could, for example, delegate. Hmm? Squash. Squash. 
<laughs> yeah, it's kind of kind of similar. Only that in this case you can't write as any user at all. Like it, it's basically the kernel tells you fuck off. It, it, the kernel tells you to go away because you get e-overflow. But that's, for example, what I tend to do if I share specific uh, data from the host into a container, uh, and the container, for example, is privileged. I just don't map UID zero in that mount. And then mm -hmm. even a privileged container can't write as UID or GID zero on the host. Yeah, so we, in HPC we have this uh, kind of trick of like uh, using seccop to like ignore basically set UID and set GID calls so mm -hmm. that people can actually install uh, packages as root mm -hmm. as themselves. Um, have you thought about basically um, like Aliasing everything that's within the isolated uh, user namespace to uh, the user that's created it, as far as persistence goes. Well, yeah, it gets it it gets messy. I mean, every time you try to map multiple UIDs to a single UID, obviously the reverse becomes impossible, which causes a lot of problems, as it turns out. Um, I mean, in in your case, like what you what uh, you know, I mentioned that you can use uh, Fuse. And that's potentially how you could do it, how you could do kind of whatever you want. Because at that point, any unprivileged user on the system can create one of those, one of those isolated user namespaces. Then they can mount a fuse file system of their choosing in there. And then they could pivot root to that and make the fuse file system their root file system. And then fuse can do whatever it wants as far as keeping persistency of UIDs and GIDs. It could write all of that in a database on the side. It could do whatever it wants. Um, so that might be, like if you don't care about like crazy performance, that's probably the easiest way to handle that because you could use Fuse as a de facto overlay file system that writes that metadata on the side effectively. Yeah, but, so, but for things like NFS and things, you'd have to proxy everything through this Fuse file system, basically? Yeah. Okay. Did you think about using file system extended attributes to store the UIDs yeah, so and GIDs that can? Funny you mention it, because when we were designing the user namespace back in, back in 2014, that was actually one of the ideas initially, was like, hey, we could do something like that from the start and just use extended attributes everywhere to store that stuff. As it turns out, that becomes really, really painful, um, because not all file systems implement them correctly. Uh, it doesn't scale. Yeah, effectively, it doesn't scale. That's kind of the issue. Uh, but it could be used, like I said, like, you know, with the fuse thing, that could be a way that you store that. You might use a user extended attributes to just store that metadata that way. Um, yeah. uh, I think we're just going to keep on with the slides for a tiny bit, and we'll do questions again at the end. Otherwise, we might just run out of time. Okay, um, can I just ask one? How sure. do you do punching through the namespace map? The use case is using architectural distribution emulation containers. Mm -hmm. I punch my own UID through and my home directory, so mm -hmm. I still have it in the distribution I'm emulating. Yeah. So technically, there's nothing that prevents you from still using UID map and GID map. So you can, you can use the combination of the two. Uh, it's, it's more fun to show with none whatsoever, because that's more fun to show as a community and privileged user. But there's technically nothing that prevents you from using a mix of the two to actually fully map a single user's shoe if you wanted to. All right. So um, isn't that going to be a massive change? That's kind of what we found. Uh, initially, we're like, well, the user namespace patch set for anyone who looked at it back in 2013, 2014, that was rough. Uh, it needed changes to every single file system. It was absolutely massive when, when Eric was doing that work. But because the Linux kernel is mostly written in macros, um, it turns out it's, it's not so difficult these days. Uh, so yeah, to our, to our astonishment, really, um, yeah, we're looking at a very, very small patch set to actually do everything that was in that demo. Um, and a bunch of it is kind of infrastructure type stuff, and then there's the actual, the actual type change. It, it wasn't so bad. We're not fully done. Uh, there, there are a few more um, issues that still need to be resolved. It possibly will be a bit larger than that, but not by much. And that's definitely something that's quite reviewable, and that is, that is hopefully not going to be scaring people all too much. It shouldn't be too difficult because you actually don't, shouldn't have to touch the, the Right, exactly. As far as all the VFS stuff, like we've not changed anything. We still do 32-bit, but it's, it's all fine. Uh, like. and, and for the rest, it's effectively just some types that had to be changed and the rest works. 
Uh, I mean, the, the main thing is kind of like add the boundaries, just like, oh, we need to go and pull the, the user credentials out of the user namespace to figure out what to show, but that's the main thing, really. Um, if you do scan the QR code, that gets you to, a Git, to the GitHub repo with the tools that I showed, as well as the link to the kernel tree that was used. Um, I don't know if you put the link to the package as well. If not, we can add that afterwards. Uh, On the uh, kernel tree. Yeah, because I did build uh, uh, the kernel I'm using, I built it for uh, Debian 11.12 and Ubuntu 20.04, so if people want to play with that, you can totally do it. Um, all right, so what's next? Well, we've showed this work at the Linux Plumbers Conference and Linux Kernel Summit uh, back, in, uh, back in November. And at the time, the demo wasn't working quite as well because we just had a bad build that day, which was unfortunate. Uh, this time, the demo, everything worked, which is cool. Um, the, we've talked to a whole bunch of people as well. I mean, Christian, obviously, we're very close with Christian, so we made sure that all of the VFS stuff and all that thing kind of makes sense. Um, the, the real next step is going to be sending an RFC to the containers kernel mailing list uh, to try and get some feedback there. Hopefully, Eric is around to actually look at it. Uh, he's a bit of a bit hit or miss here as far as him answering stuff, but hopefully we get to have that reviewed by, um, by the user namespace maintainer. Um, before we do that, there are a few more things, though. Um, we want to be able to run kind of normal LXC, LXD, incurs type containers with this feature. And for that, one issue we've got right now is around cgroupfs uh, and the cgroup namespace. So what we want to be able to do is create uh, entries in the cgroup tree. Normally, you would then churn them to the right thing, which is a bit impossible. Uh, and after that, you would do the unshare of the cgroup namespace, and then you can use that from inside the container. So the impossible part is obviously a, a bit of an issue. Uh, so we're looking at how to fix that. Um, I think that we've, we've bounced a bunch of ideas over the past few days with, uh, with Alex. I mean, one of them is to effectively do a VFS ID map type stuff on top of uh, cgroupfs. Um, we'll see if Christian wants to kill us when we send that, but uh, <laughs> that's one of the ideas. There are a few other tricks that could be done to make, um, make kernelfs be more aware of the 64-bit thing to handle those specific cases to be seen. Like, there's, there's a bit of... But that's one of the, one of the issues right now that prevent, like, a straight-up LXC container from just working. Um, there's also still some work to be done around SEM creds, like passing around new creds and that kind of stuff to make sure that this also passes the credential of uh, the creator of the user namespace instead of an overflow UID. Definitely, uh, yes, definitely yes. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are a few, a few more bits here and there as far as like those boundaries that just need to look at and make sure that it's kind of consistent as far as what's exposed. Um, once that's actually been sent, hopefully reviewed or hopefully merged, there are a few more things that we will need to consider doing on top of that. Um, the biggest one of those being nesting. So being able to create either an isolated user namespace instead, inside of an isolated user namespace, because who doesn't like, you know, total all the way down, um, but also being able to create a normal user namespace inside of an isolated user namespace. Why? Uh, well, the, it's the usual reason. The usual reason is someone wants to run their old uh, LXC, Docker, whatever thing inside of, a container. I that's think that's such tough, something we shouldn't do. We shouldn't mix isolated and regular. I, mm. Isolated should only do isolated and not yeah. have any ID mappings attached and as regular user as an isolated mm. user and as I think it's just painful. Yeah. Why? We'll have to see just how nasty it gets. I, I mean, I agree that the main case we care about initially is going to be isolated and isolated because that's what we mostly want for like testing and whatever. Um, regular and isolated. Um, We'll have to see just how many people we break and how bad it would be to fix. If it's trivial to do, then maybe. If it's a massive patch to make it work, then it's not worth the effort, I agree. Um, and, and that's it. So we can do more questions. I think there were a few more. So you can only really write to a TampaFest unless you start doing the uh, UID map mounts, right? Right, TempFS or Fuse. And Fuse is kind of magic because you can do a lot of stuff with Fuse, yes, it turns but out. <laughs> is there any way to, so I want to use this in MakeOS side too. Mm -hmm. I use new UID map, new UID yep. map now, and Leonard hates it uh -huh. because it's at UID and everything. Mm -hmm. like, it just sucks. Yep. So the problem is like writing, making these images takes quite a bit of space. So if right. I have to do it all in the TempFS, the right. machine is just going to run out of memory. Mm -hmm. So is there any way to get the TempFS back by, I don't know, a swap file or something so that I can actually 
Mm. To somehow get this stuff. Uh, Possibly. Uh, I mean, I don't know if the TempFS supports that, and maybe some of the other virtual file systems have something similar. Uh, like, can we, is there like a TempFS backed by file type stuff in the kernel? No, no I think so, right? No. Um, I mean, yeah, right now you would do Fuse, and Fuse you can make it right to whatever the hell you want. The, the question is going to be performance. Yeah. Uh, Fuse got a lot better because of the work on Vata UFS. Um, like they've, they've done a lot of optimizations for that. Uh, Five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's fine. We're in questions anyway. Um, I mean, we're looking at VFS uh, at like unprivileged support for a bunch of other file systems kind of down the line, but they're mostly networked type file system, which will probably not help you a whole lot. So. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, so maybe I missed it, but can you actually figure out from the outside that you are using this isolated? I forgot to space? show that. Yes, you can. Because um, does that like actually work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think personally that like the issue with a lot of interfaces in the kernel is that yeah. you cannot figure out that something is actually happening or not. Yeah, so um, in here, like you see everything belongs to the Ubuntu user, but if I look at that use UID 556 and I look at the status file, uh, and we look at the UID, you see there's isolated UIDs and isolated GID in there, which shows you the inside UID and GID, um, so you can actually figure it out that way. And it gets you all of the different ones, like the uh, effective and all of those. Okay. So maybe not to you, but uh, a general comment. Can we actually have this in a JSON or something in the kernel? <laughs> because <laughs> Because there are lots of tools that are parsing this and they are doing it incorrectly a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think that this is possible because this file gets generated as a SQL file, sequence file in the kernel. So uh, it just gets generated line by line. So JSON is just too hard, too complex for the kernel. So that's why. Yeah. yeah. But you know we can ha we can have Tycho add something to like lib resource or whatever we come up with as far as libraries to also pass that file Past because we're we're looking at that passing all of those stupid <laughs> files. <so. laughs> I think this file is like extremely easy to pass compared to Mountain Four or CPU Info or a bunch of the others. But yes, um, there there was concern about uh, security around uh, user namespaces and I think about APA more restriction. Oh yeah, Ubuntu had fun with that one, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that helping in some ways? Or? Uh, no, it's gonna make it worse for Apama, I think. But, um, it's like, a bunch of these shows initially were of the opinion that like, user namespace is the devil and we should just prevent everyone from using it, uh, unless you're root, which kind of defeats the purpose to an extent. Um, uh, so there's, they kind of had the big hammer turn things off. Then Ubuntu did a really weird thing recently, and it's just in the Ubuntu kernel, which makes it even worse, which is that you get to only use user namespaces on Ubuntu if you're running from a program that has an Apamo profile that allows it. Um, that has caused a lot of people to stop using the Ubuntu kernel, because um, that's really, it's, it's kind of weird, and there's no other way to kind of opt out of this particular feature, which is kind of bizarre. Um, so we'll see. This, I mean, it's still going to be a user namespace. So any kind of concerns around those users then being able to, like, you're still in a user namespace. You can still create network devices. You can still access more APIs than you normally can as a community and privileged user. So this, those concerns are still valid, and I expect, therefore, any distro that offers knobs to turn things off will also effectively turn that one off at the same time. Um, the question, the, the thing Ty, is this is going to make adoption of user namespace in other applications for other developers significantly easier, which may put some pressure on distros to not outright block things because they're going to be blocking actual useful workloads. We have one minute. Yeah, one minute. We can probably do like one more question or uh, people can always catch me afterwards. If you do unshare network in a user namespace, then that's unshare privilege escalation. Yeah. <laughs> because of all the UAFs and network yeah. code. So just do that, la that last question, and then if anyone has more stuff, I'm happy to, to take them afterwards. Um. So in the uh, patch chat, uh, I didn't see like any test. Uh, how much uh, have you effort have you put into like fuzzing this or like uh, writing tests for it and mm -hmm. check so for unintended interactions? Yeah. So testing is interesting. Uh, I don't know if we actually have a lot of user namespace tests in the kernel, which is kind of unfortunate. 
uh, I think that's something that should be improved and we should probably take a look at, try at starting to get that ball rolling Green. with this one. That would be really good to see. Because like, the, the VFS stuff is very well tested, the user namespace stuff not so much. That's our plan to write this test, yeah. For not, for, for not, a, not an isolated case and for isolated two. So we want to write tests for both isolated case and for non-isolated two. Because we have not so much. Yet. All right, thanks everyone.